we've been looking at this whole issue of working with walls and different sort of variations on that theme. And hopefully it's been kind of cool to kind of play around with these things. Um, this sort of mind map of all the different slides and stuff is it going to be available online. The uh, slides are available just in a PDF form. But I'll encourage you to also download this, because what we've done with this thing and how you'll be able to use it is for each of these different topics, if, for example, you want to know more about creating stacked walls, there's a link here that'll actually take you out to a video that'll talk about just that specific topic. We did a whole series of videos for Autodesk a couple years ago that are really just all about kind of these specific things, uh, working through sort of an introductory experience for doing modeling. So this whole thing about modifying wall types, structures, design features like stacked walls, it's a little four minute video there that'll kind of really quickly go boom, boom, boom through some of the essential steps. So if you missed something, you could also go there. And so what we do is in the mind map whenever I can, and I have something that's appropriate, I'll put a little link in there for you to kind of like uh, tell you where you can find an online video for that stuff. Okay, let's switch our gears a little bit. We're gonna take a look at windows and doors. And windows and doors aren't gonna be all that different from what we talked about last time. We're gonna choose where to place them, you add them to our model. We're gonna look at a sort of a few variations here. We're gonna look at sort of using arrays to actually sort of go through and place a lot of windows efficiently. Setting the window properties of the materials and creating new window types for different sizes. You know, that's pretty standard stuff in terms of what's going on. We'll also look at a special type of opening. So it's like a window or a door, but it doesn't have anything in it. We'll just call it a wall opening because it's really just kind of a special shape like opening through it. And we'll show you how you can put some of those in there. So that's where we're going next. Okay, in terms of where we place windows, let's just think about that from an architectural standpoint. There's lots of things we're trying to do. Really figure out where the views are, sort of what we're trying to see from within the building. Often we're trying to create aesthetic effects, so doing things like putting a lot of small windows in a vertical stack is really just trying to create a specific architectural style. We're trying to do things like getting daylighting into the building so we can use natural daylighting as opposed to using power whenever we can. And often we're trying to capture solar radiation, so letting uh, the solar radiation come in through the windows and hit a thermal mass to heat up the building. Okay. We also have to pay attention to windows from an emergency egress standpoint. This is a very big thing if you do like residential construction. Every bedroom has to have emergency egress. Or actually, it's really so firefighters can get in and rescue someone from that. That's what really determines the dimensions. But it's, uh, you know, so there's this whole notion of having to provide windows. That's why it's hard to put bedrooms in a basement because you need windows on every bedroom, not for light, somewhat for light and livability, but it's mostly from the emergency egress standpoint. So we also use windows in addition to doors for egress in a lot of rooms too. In terms of placing these things in our model, let's think about that. The big issue is that they're hosted by walls. We can work with dimensions to control where they are, and we can even think about using uh, oh, yeah, constraints on dimensions to control the locations. So let's go ahead and start by taking a look at that. Let's go back over to Revit, and I will give myself a relatively clean wall to work with. Again, I'll go back to the floor plan view, and I'll draw another wall just so we can have something to work with. Oh, how about if I use, I'll use that new type we created a little while ago, the uh, stone panels on metal stud. Put it out here. Notice as I'm drawing it, the exterior finish is showing up at the top, which is actually where I don't want it to show up. So I'm going to draw it the other way. It's because of the notion of the clockwise and the counterclockwise. I'll draw it this way, and then the finish will show up on the bottom side. Hey, let's go back to 3D. So there's my stone panel wall. It's just waiting to have some windows placed into it. So let's talk about it. As you're placing windows, the issue is that you go to the window tool, and you can choose a window type. And of the various types that are available here, just kind of choose the size and the shape that you want. I'm going to stick with one of the relatively rectangular ones for now. I can place them in 3D. Placing in 3D, again, is a little bit hard because it's going to try and figure out where level one is, but it may not do a very good job. So placing them in 2D in the floor plan view gives you a little more control over which level it's going to be associated with. But I'll put it in 3D just as a starting point. I can place another one over here. I can place another one over here, maybe another one over here. Okay, So I got a bunch of windows in there. 
You might notice I didn't do a, well, a very precise job about placing them all at the same height and kind of giving them a very good spacing, so let's talk about that. Windows have these type or instance properties. I can choose one. Let me teach you this technique. You can control click to get a second one. See if you can get all four of them. Control clicking on all the different windows. So control, then click. And we can look at the instance properties. Okay, if you have multiple things selected and you go to the instance properties, often you'll get blanks in here. Because what happens is, if in the selection the same values aren't common amongst all the selected things, it'll show a blank in there. You can type something in there and that'll apply to all the selected ones. So for example, if I want these things all to be at three feet off the floor, I can type that in there. And then that'll level across all those different windows. It'll move them all to that. So control clicking is a useful technique. Sort of get used to the idea of control clicking to grab things. Okay, so now all those windows are at the same height. They're not, however, spaced out very well left to right. And that's okay. You know, sometimes architecturally we want them spaced very evenly. Sometimes we don't want them spaced very evenly. But if you do want them spaced very evenly, let's take a look at how you could do that. For example, maybe these three over here I want to kind of think of as a group, and they'll all be spaced very evenly. And this one over here I'll let kind of hang out off on the side all by itself. So how you can do that looks like this. If I go to the floor plan view and go zoom in on in, you can choose your windows just fine. Let me choose a window. You can see that one's five foot one center to center to the next one. This one's five feet over there. They're actually not too far off, really, in the scheme of things. If I want to control things, I can move those around. If I want to, I can also just type a value in here, like four feet. Okay, so you can control things with the temporary dimensions, and that'll work just fine. Get things where you want. We can also, though, use dimensions to go through and start putting some constraints on things. For example, if I know that this window always wants to be five feet from that side over there, I can make that uh, temporary dimension permanent by clicking here. And then on that, I can lock that side. So whatever happens, that is always going to be five feet from that side. Now, just because I locked it doesn't mean I can't change it anymore. I can still change it to another value. Well, I'm gonna, it's, gonna, it's making a liar out of me. Do I have to unlock it and do it? Okay, then relock it. Okay, so you can go ahead and change those things around after the fact. So you can use dimensions that way. Let me show you another way to use dimensions, though, that's kind of cool. And that is as follows. If I want to go through and have a dimension that actually says things should be the same or equal, you could do something like this. I can, let's go to the annotate tool, and we're going to create a dimension. We're going to create something called an align dimension. And if you choose align dimension, this is going to be how we place dimensions when we actually want to place them manually. You go hovering over things, and what you'll start to see is that as you hover over different objects, you'll get different reference lines on those objects. Right now, I'm over the center line of that window. So when I'm placing dimensions, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go ahead and through the uh, model, click on each of the different things that I want to reference. The center line of this window, the center line of that window, the center line of the third window. Okay, and when I'm done clicking on things I want to reference, I just click out into space somewhere, and that last click will say, put a dimension in that kind of relates those things that we're referencing each other. Okay, so let's try that. Okay, what I'm doing is I go to the annotate tab, say aligned, and let us choose, just hover right over the center line of a window, then over the center line of another window. Now, if you have a curved wall, and you're, you know, there's, there's a whole other issue about trying to dimension the windows on that. So, you know, see if you can do it on a little straight wall. There. We'll do it there. Okay. I'm going to go through and just click now out into space and put the dimension out there. So see if you can get that. I want to get a chain of dimensions. Because for this thing about equality, we need to have a, a single chain of dimensions as, a bunch of as opposed to a bunch of individual dimensions. Okay. So I got this chain of dimensions hanging around over here. And notice up here, whenever you have chains, there's this option, should they be equally spaced or not equally spaced? 
And if you go through and see how it says like not equal right now? If you go tapping on that, it'll change it to equally spaced. Now that's kind of cool in its own right that it'll go through and space things out evenly. Yeah, that's kind of nice in its own sort of like a, to save me some time of having to figure out and do the math to figure that out. But let's show you how powerful it can be. If, for example, I move this window, notice it'll maintain that equal boundary, it'll or that equal constraint. So if you say they're going to be equal, that spacing is always going to be equal. So you can move the endpoints and things will stretch out or kind of like contract as necessary to maintain that equality constraint. So again, let's take a look at that one more time. I'm going to like come back out here. I place dimension first and equality is turned off. They're just plain old dimensions. But if I choose it and turn equality on, okay, the dimensions will show up a little bit differently. They'll show up as equal. And if they are equal, I can do it by moving the middle one too. If I move the middle one, it'll move the end one too, so that the equality is already main, always maintained. So that's a really handy thing for doing things like windows. If you, for example, go to the outside of the Y2E2 building at lunch today and take a look around, see if you can figure out all the equal dimensions on the windows that were placed. We tend to put things in very regular patterns and put some order to them, and there really is you know, we sort of have like a 3-2 pattern. So three things are spaced the same, then there's a little bit of variation, then three more things are spaced the same. There's like a, but, you know, the human, the human eye are aesthetic. We like rhythm and we like patterns. So as opposed to just having everything just sort of randomly placed, that's kind of a good way to do that. Okay, so the equality constraint making sense? Most of you got the idea of a string of dimensions and being able to turn on equality? Because if you like that, let me give you a, another variation on it, which is even a little more powerful, called arrays. Which arrays are all about the notion of having sort of multiple things that are sort of related to each other, but um, that you can sort of copy them at a fixed distance. So as opposed to putting them all individually and then making them the same distance, let's just sort of copy them in a very regular pattern and be able to drive it from that side. So let me show you what it looks like. What we're going to do is create something called a linear array. And it's pretty straightforward. We can do it with anything. We can do it with windows. We can do it with furniture. We can do anything that we want. But we basically are going to go ahead and choose an object. We're going to say array it. Then we'll choose the distance to the second object and say how many of these things we want to create. And it will create a number of them that all have that same relationship. So as we go through and do this, we can either sort of specify the distance to the second one, or we can specify the distance to the last one, just kind of whichever way you want. Often I specify things from first to last and let it fill in the middle, but it's really whatever seems to make the most sense for your spacing. So for example, if you wanted to put a lot of studs at 16 inches on center, or you wanted to put a lot of joists at 24 inches on center, or anything that has a very regular spacing and a lot of them, rather than copying them individually, arraying is a very nice way to do that. OK, so let's take a look at what that actually looks like over here in the model. I'm going to come back over here, and I will actually delete some of these, because I'm going to try arraying these instead. So I got that individual window there, and I want to create an array of windows. And again, an array of windows will all have a bunch of windows of the same type and kind of copy them around. Now for doing this, you can array a single object, or if you have two or three objects, like three windows of different sizes that are all stacked together, we could array all three of those together. Anything you put into a group will be arrayed. Okay, and then you can edit that group if you want to. So let's just sort of show you what that looks like. We'll choose this guy, that one window. We'll go to the Modify Windows tab now, and we'll find the Array tool. And really, whatever you select on the Modify tab, you'll find the Array tool. So go ahead and choose that. In the array tool, a very nice uh, operation just for uh, copying things around, we have the notion, is it going to be a linear array or a radial array? That's what those two choices are. OK, so linear, just stretched out along a line, radial being around a center point, if we want to kind of like uh, kind of rotate things around. Group and associate, we'll leave that on for now. That's the whole notion of, as we create these new objects, they want to have them sort of stay related together so I could keep on changing them as one. Or should they really sort of be spawning off as independent elements? Okay. Grouping kind of makes it so that later on, if you change one, you can change them all. 
Okay, the number that we want to create, let me say I want to create like three of these things. I can choose whether I want to put it the second location or the last location. Let me just choose second for now. And what I'll do is say from that center line to here, that's one increment, but you'll see it'll actually create three of them because I put the number three in there. And in fact, if I want to change that and say that now I want to put four in there, I can type four. Or I can even come in here and change that to five. That's funny. It's something about the way I have the dimensions set up right now. It's irrelevant to what we're doing, but I'll just let you know what's going on. So I can keep on changing these out. I can put six in there. I think at six, they're probably like hanging off the wall which is probably not a very good thing. But the seventh one's going to complain because it won't have a wall to host it anymore. So I can go ahead and do these by basically saying the distance from one to the second and then change the number. Or another way to do this that you might want to explore looks like this. Let's go back to level one. Let me go ahead and I'll undo all this. So I'm back to just my one little lonely window. Actually, get rid of that one too. This time for arraying, let's see what happens if you say the end point as opposed to the second point. So if I choose the window and I say array it, and I say that the last point is going to be over here somewhere. OK, here's two still, so only two of them. So far, so good. If I put in three, it'll space it in there. If I put in four, It'll space it in there. If I put it at five, or if I put it at six, okay, so the big difference is, you know, how do you want to drive this? Do you want to drive it from the endpoints and subdivide, or do you want to drive it by relative distance and just keep on replicating the number that you need? So, either way works. But arraying sort of a very handy technique for doing stuff like this. Let me tell you about the effect of grouping, though, just because we want to sort of mention that as a variable you want to play with. And that is over here on the grouped elements. Oh, here we have this like a uh, little element. You see it's part of a group right now. If I want to change that thing that is arrayed around, I'm really going to change the group. I need to say edit the group. So if you have a grouped element, say edit the group. And let's talk about what happens. So I choose it, it's grouped, I can edit the group. Notice everything else grays out, so I'm just looking at that one element right now, or that's the thing I'm going to be editing right now. For that grouped element right there, I can now make a change. For example, I don't want that to be a fixed window, I want it to be a round window. Okay, changed it that one time. Okay, see where this is going? If I finish the group, Okay, it'll change all the elements of the group that are related that way. So this whole notion of arraying and grouping could actually be pretty powerful for you because if you define an entire facade of regularly spaced openings and have them all grouped together and arrayed, really quickly in two or three clicks, I can go ahead and change a new window and a new spacing that throughout the entire facade really nicely. Okay, so just be aware of that. Again. Just, you know, just trying to introduce you to the concept of doing this. You won't necessarily need to do this on every building, but especially as you start working at, if you find yourself copy and adjust the dimension and copy and adjust the dimension, about the third or fourth time, remember, you know, I think there was some better way to do that. I can't ask, because there is. Okay, so I just want to like, you know, tickle your imagination that way. Okay. In terms of window properties, let's take a look at that in window types. For the properties themselves, we looked at that a little bit. There's instance properties, the notion of really what the sill and the base are. There's also a nice property called the mark. Let me, not, let me tell you what that is. The mark is actually an ID number for that window. So every window, in fact, every element in our whole database has a mark to it. 
It has some ID number. So you can think of it like your student ID or your social security or something like that number. It's, it's unique to that window. And we like that because then when we're tabulating things, every element in the model has a unique idea we can grab it, uh, idea we can grab it by. So that's what the mark is. It's really just an ID number. There's also a type mark. A type mark is something that sort of all the different elements that have the same type have in common. So for example, if you're all Stanford students and Stanford is school 100 versus Berkeley students and Berkeley is school 150, your type mark would be 100 because you're all of the type Stanford student and that's the identifier for that. So watch out for that, the sort of type mark versus your individual ID. Okay, and it's again just a way of categorizing and sort of uh, you know, summarizing things that make it a little bit easier. Okay, so we have instance properties. We also have type properties. Instance properties tend to be the things that control the individual location. At the type level, we often control things like the trim of the window and the size of the window. So let's go and take a look at some of that. So for example, let me edit this group. And I'll edit this type. The instance properties are the sill height, the head height, things like that. The type properties are things like the materials and the actual dimensions. So for example, for this, if you don't want to have a material called trim, if you'd like to have a material called, oh, let's call it uh, wood sherry, that doesn't look very different. Wood pine. Or let me go for something even worse. We'll go for uh, a more dramatic. Let's go to paint, and we'll just paint them black. I can paint the exterior trim black by doing this. I could also paint the interior trim if I want to. Let's give it a different color, the white color. Okay. I could also change the dimensions right here. This is going to affect all of those different ones of that same type. So you'll see right here that actually, kind of interesting, it looks like my windows are inside out because what I thought was the inside is actually on the outside. I wanted the black on the outside. Not to worry though, we'll come back over here. I can sort of see what's happening and there it is, it's flipped. The arrow is always on the outside of the window, the arrow control. Let's go back to 3D. Okay, now I got it on the outside. And when I finish this, they'll all adapt that. So you can change type properties to change the materials. So think about whether you want wood or metal or uh, some sort of painted surface for those things. You could also change the glazing properties. So as opposed to clear glass, if you want sort of a translucent glass or some sort of frosted glass or a different colored glass, you can put that in there. Okay. You could also change the sizes. For the sizes though, here's what I'm going to advocate you do and that's to go through and instead of sort of changing Oh, let me put another one in because it'll be a little bit easier. These ones are grouped, so it's kind of a little messy because I'm always ungrouping. Put that one in there. For the sizes, though, what I'm going to advocate is, as opposed to actually changing this, I'd like to keep the 36 by 48 hanging around because that may be useful to me sometimes. So rather than changing the type property here, what I'd advocate is duplicate the type and create a new size so that you have the 36 by 48 as well as your new size. So let's duplicate it. I'll say, oh, it's going to be uh, 72 inches by 48. And then we can change the 72 inches down here. And now we have a new type to work with. Okay, So watch out for that. Be conscious of when you're changing the properties of an existing type versus when you're actually creating a new type. And what you, know, you want to watch out for is if you change the properties of an existing type because you want this one to have a black ring around it, you're actually changing all the ones of the same type. So it may be better to create another type so that you can change one specific instance or whether you want it to apply globally to everything in your model. Okay, so you gotta kinda think about that. Oh, and these will only apply to your model. They won't apply to other models okay, that you don't have open right now. Can you import them into other models? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And how you do that, a very good question, is for example, here's the windows. I can always load a family. So if you save out a family or load a family, you can go out to the library. And this is where you can get things off the uh, web if you want to, or we can just sort of share them with each other. Let's go ahead and say, um, uh, oh, 
Let me get that round top. I always like that one because it looks very different. And we'll put that in there. Okay, so you can save these things out. You can actually save yours out too. For yours, they show up down in the family browser. If I go to under Windows, they're all available down here. And if you want to export yours, you can do a, like a save there and save it out to disk and then share it with someone else. Okay, so that's kind of the gist of Windows. I'm not going to belabor Windows too much. For doors, I'm trying to think of where we are because I could dive into doors. I think I may sort of skip doors because they're so similar to Windows. I don't think you really need to see that. I'd rather kind of like launch into curtain walls a little bit in our last 10 minutes and show you that. Because doors, we put doors in, we add doors to our building model by basically working with the constraints. We can place them in groups. That should look very familiar to the window stuff. And for the door types, same sort of thing. Create new sizes by creating types and duplicating them. So yeah, it's, it's kind of repeating the same message. So that's not high value for you. I'd rather go ahead and show you curtain walls instead. Is that okay? Okay, we'll jump over there because that's something a little different. 